Wow, we're already nearing the end of the series and this year. And unlike the usual thing, for me personally, I really don't feel like this year has flown by. But whatever, you know, time is an illusion anyway. So welcome back to Style Study Moon. Now, today's video is interesting because I hadn't really heard of this artist until it was requested recently. And then I looked back and it turns out she's been requested a few times. And I'm so glad she has because this study has really helped me hit so many of my art goals in just one week. Today we're going to take a look at the incredible, dynamic, amazing, whimsical art of the artist known as Ray underscore 17. Like I said, this style has been requested several times, so I'm going to have to read this off a list. Thank you to Angelica Pablo, Cake, I literally don't know how to say the rest of this word, um, Color Rock, Blobfish, and Call Me underscore Senpai for requesting this video. I really hope you guys enjoy it. Now, if this is your very first style study, hi, welcome. My name is Swish and I'm so glad you're here because today we're going to level up your art by like a million percent. Style Study is a regular series we do here on my channel where we take a look at some of our favourite contemporary artists, analyse their work and see what we can learn from it. Keyword, learn. We're not here to plagiarise anyone's work or copy their style, we're only here to learn some really cool art tips and tricks and see how we can apply these to finding our own unique art style. I usually structure my style studies in three parts. In part one, we'll take a look at Ray's work, analyze her style, and see what we can learn from it. Part two will be a study of one of her original paintings. The incredible reference I've chosen today is this one. And in part three, we'll apply everything that we learned today to an original painting of our own. Of course, if you enjoy this video and learned something today, please remember to like and subscribe. Comment below your biggest lesson from today's video and come say hello on Instagram and Discord. All of the links are down in the description. And now, if you're ready, grab a snack, sit back, and let's dive into another style study featuring Ray underscore 17. Ray is a 32-year-old manga artist and illustrator from China, and that's all we know about her. Seriously, there is no info, no interviews, and boy, oh boy, is that always an absolutely delicious mystery. Why is it so fascinating when people are so private? Like, we're just nosy as a species, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Anyway, what we have loads and loads of are her illustrations. Like, oh my god, look at these beautiful pieces. They are just so intricate and colourful and ugh, I've been so eager to dive into this study all month. Ray's incredible art has garnered her over 516,000 followers on Twitter. So if I had to describe Ray's work in one word, it'd have to be dynamic. There are these incredibly fast-paced character pieces that instantly throw you right into the middle of all the action. You'll see lots of really busy compositions with a ton of little details and elements. It's all extremely energetic. With the characters themselves, they are definitely very anime-like, but it almost feels more elevated than traditional manga or anime. Ray's art feels like a higher fantasy version of the style, which also uses tons of very sophisticated art techniques. In that sense, she's definitely an unconventionalist. Speaking of Liz, here are four key characteristics to Ray's art. Like we've already seen, Ray paints these incredible compositions that are insanely dynamic. Not only are there loads of leading lines, they are often made of these short, jagged shapes. So not only are our eyes being zipped around the composition, the little tiny elements create a lot of visual noise in the piece as well. 
even the characters are in very dynamic poses, often literally flying or kicking or falling. And if they're in more static or calm poses, Ray tends to play with the perspective and foreshortening so that they look dynamic. So here, for instance, although this character is only stood here holding what looks like a gun, the pose doesn't look too static or boring because the perspective is pushed to a top-down view. Same here with this character who's just standing here, the top-down perspective makes it feel more dynamic than it actually is. When it comes to the noise though, there are so many detailed elements that make up Ray's compositions, it almost feels overwhelming. No matter how simple or complex the scene is, all these extra elements really push the complexity regardless. Here with this portrait, there's waves lapping at his knees, there's a star casting loads of rays of light, there's these waterfall type design elements, there's what looks like a chain that breaks into little jagged pieces, all of this in a single character piece. So then if we look at something like this with a bunch of characters and horses, there is already so much noise, but then Ray also adds all these flying arrows and even the subtle clouds to really push the dynamism. However, one thing that struck me about a lot of Ray's paintings is that they aren't always logical scenes. So there isn't always like a structured foreground, mid-ground, background. It doesn't always look like these are taking place at a physical location. There's almost like a movie poster quality to some of these paintings in that there's multiple characters all in different perspectives and not necessarily interacting with each other. I just thought that was super interesting because it almost feels like surrealism. Here's the thing about good art. No matter how crazy or dynamic it is, there is always an element of balance. And even though Ray's art is fast paced and visually noisy, it does not feel unbalanced at all. And that is because for all the visual noise caused by the composition, there is a lot of visual quietness brought in by the color and light. Looking at the lighting first, for the most part the primary key light is a flat, diffused white light. Not only does this keep most of the surfaces fairly low contrast, it also highlights pretty much all aspects of the design. You very rarely see any lost edges and there's pretty much never any harsh shadows at all, especially on the skin. Does that mean there are no dark values whatsoever? No you will see dark values, but those are in objects that are inherently dark. Like here for instance, these characters have dark hair and dark clothes, so those add all the contrast needed to balance the values out, but the darkness isn't caused by shadows per se, it's just the actual colour of the object, not a trick of the light. With the colour palette, now this is where we see a low contrast that still looks vibrant. You'll see with the colours that they are pretty much all the same level of saturation. Either they're all low sat or all high sat. There's pretty much never a situation where you have both high and low saturation colours in one piece. The point is the colours and the values are fairly calm in terms of their relativity and that in itself is quite a loud contrast to the visually noisy aspects of the composition. So in that sense, it really is all perfectly balanced. Let's now look at some of the smaller details that also happen to be my personal favourite part of Ray's work, and that is the holographic shine. In a lot of the character pieces, you'll see what appears to be super bright, super saturated pops of colour seemingly in random places. However, these are not random in any way whatsoever, because when it comes to the hue and the placement of these holographic pops of light, there actually seems to be a specific formulaic approach. So first and foremost, you'll mostly see the pops of colour in either the hair or in the fabric that is supposed to look like silk. 
all these holographic colors are almost always hard-edged and they replace what would otherwise be specular highlights. Now, in terms of what colors get chosen, there's a two-layered approach. The first holographic color, and this one is the most prominent, is usually a super bright color that is directly complementary to the surrounding hue. So, if the hair is blue, like it is here, the most prominent highlight will be orange, as you can see. However, we then see colors around these highlights that are hue shifted, slightly less bright versions of the two main colors. So here with the mostly pink purple hair, while you see the main pops of light are like a pale orangey yellow, you also see hues around the purple and the yellow that are slightly shifted from the two. So right next to the palest yellows, you see slightly more red shifted oranges, while next to the purples, you'll see saturated blues and again, reds. It's like Ray builds a little color gradient that spans just about half the color wheel, but by varying the sizes, brightness, and saturation of each in-between tone, it looks like a holographic surface as opposed to just a noisy mess. Speaking of noisy messes, here's how Ray prevents the paintings from being just that, given how many elements are in the composition. There is this expert control over textures and edges. You'll see that she mostly uses hard edge shades that kind of look like when you paint wet on dry with watercolors. However, within shapes that lie over rounded forms, such as the apples of the cheek or where the hair drapes over the roundness of the skull, you'll definitely see a fair bit of color blending that softens these areas out. Pretty much all the texture seems to come from the brushwork though, as opposed to any specific texture overlays, so there is still this kind of uniformity across the piece that helps balance out the sheer number of objects in the scene. Finally, let's take a quick look at the proportions, because although the core of Ray's work is her rendering and compositional choices, the characters themselves are a huge point of focus here. Ray generally sticks to very anime-esque proportions, where there is a distinct difference in masculine versus feminine faces. The feminine characters have your classic baby face, so large, round eyes placed very low on the head, tiny, minimized noses, if any, and small lips that are pretty much only indicated by the line of separation and a little shadow above the chin. The feminine bodies are pretty much idealized for what is generally feminine appeal. So you see noticeable curves, skinny arms, and narrow waist. Everything is usually soft and rounded, very um, waif-like. With the more masculine characters, they are stylized on the opposite end, so the eyes are wide but not quite as round and are placed quite high up on the head. The nose is significantly larger than in the feminine faces, though a lot smaller than in a realistic face. There's high angular cheekbones and a squarer jaw. Everything is just sharper and more angular. Same with the bodies, they're stylized according to the masculine ideal. You'll see broad shoulders and chests and very narrow hips, lots of musculature in the arms and often well-defined abs and pecs. That's not to say, however, that Ray only ever paints traditionally masculine or feminine characters. This is just their facial and body proportions. The full expression of these characters' gender identities usually comes from their hair, outfit, and accessory choices, and those don't necessarily follow the cisgender heteronormative social norms, which is something we absolutely love to see in popular art. So to sum up part one of this study, here are four key characteristics to raise R. Number one, the composition is extremely fast paced with lots of small, visually noisy elements that keep our eyes darting across the scene. Two, this super fast paced composition is offset by calmer, lower contrast lighting, as well as color palettes where pretty much all colors are equally saturated. 
Number three, holographic pops of highlights really add a ton of whimsy to elevate the piece, and the use of hard edge shapes with a bit of blending here and there really help the textures feel balanced. And number four, the proportions are very close to traditional manga and anime style faces and bodies in that they are idealized to be super masculine or super feminine. For our study today, this is the adorable reference that I've chosen. It looked fairly simple, at least compared to most of Ray's other art, but oh boy, let me tell you, this is probably the most layers I've used in a painting to date. But before we get into that, let's talk about this sketch. Any person who thinks drawing anime proportions is easier than drawing realism? Literally how? The whole time I was putting the sketch down, I was honestly so worried because it felt like I was getting every single detail completely wrong. And this feeling became twice as intense when I lowered the opacity and started to do a cleaner sketch on top. I don't know if it was the pose of the body or the tilt of the head or the outfit or that basket on her back, but I have never felt more uncertain while putting down a sketch for a study. Next, it was time to put down some flats, and this is where all of those layers come in. Now, usually I'll do layers based on the actual objects in the scene. So the skin is one layer, the fabric is another, the jewelry is another, and so on. For this piece, however, what I noticed was all the color repetition. The teal in the hair was the same teal in the fabric. The orange in the hair was also in the fabric, the belt, the wristband, and the slippers. So this time around, I grouped these layers based on color as opposed to the composition. And so we have a ton of layers. I actually color coded them because it was that kind of day. <laughs> However, once all the base colors were down, the rest of the process was actually speedier than I anticipated. I pretty much did the entire painting with just the one brush, the hard edge round brush with pressure opacity dynamics. I'd imagine this part of the rendering takes significantly longer with paintings where Ray creates those super dynamic compositions, but hey, this was always meant to be just a super quick study. Also, do you guys ever watch something specific when you're painting and then watching back your painting process reminds you of what you were watching at the time? I was in a horror movie kick the day I painted this and that's all I could think about while scripting this bit. Anyway, I went around adding the final little details like the tiny hanging lantern thing and the droplets of water and here's the finished study. I really love it. What do you think? Okay, can I be honest with you guys for a second? When it came to this original painting, I was extremely intimidated. The references I'd collected for it were just so amazing and detailed, and I had absolutely no way of matching that level of detail in the two days that I'd allotted for this painting. Plus, I got real ill real quick, and it was just a lot altogether. <laughs> However, I wanted to capture the feeling of secondhand rage here. You know that feeling when someone you love and care about is treated so horribly and you want to stand up and fix the situation, but it's just really not your place to say anything? It leaves you kind of feeling frustrated and useless, but still filled with so much rage. I wanted to go for a top-down view here with some foreshortening since I really don't practice foreshortening nearly enough. I wanted to be creative with a super fast-paced composition with loads of elements, but it honestly felt like a little bit of a creative block. Anyway, after overthinking and blocking in the colors, it was time to paint. I knew quite early on that I really wanted to throw in some saturated pops of color in both the skin and the hair, and also to some extent in the clothing. Since all those aspects started out with warm global tones, the colors had to be like saturated teal and blue. And with the hair, since we want that holographic color pop, Along with a bright blue highlight, I also threw in a bright orange highlight and some deeper blue-violet colors around the teal. 
To contrast the bright, low contrast stuff, I threw in some really dark fabric in her outfit, though that was a little redundant later on because I ended up just darkening the background anyway. After more colour and contrast adjustments, here's the finished piece. I still don't know how I feel about this, but let me know what you guys think. And there we have it, Ray 17 Demystified. Yeah, that addition of like random pops of saturated colors in all the right places, that's exactly what I've been looking for. I'm definitely taking that with me. That was my biggest lesson from today's video. So what was yours? Let me know in the comments below. And of course, I have linked Ray's work down in the description. Make sure you go check her out and show her some love for me. Thank you so much again to Angelica Pablo Cake Color Rock, Blockfish, and Call Me Senpai for requesting this video. I really hope you guys enjoyed it and that it's everything you've been looking for. And if the rest of you guys enjoyed this video as well, please remember to like and subscribe. It really helps the channel out so much. And next week, we're going to finish up the series with a bang by looking at one of my absolute all-time favorite artists. Um, so make sure you have your notifications turned on for that because you do not want to miss it, yeah? Come say hello on Instagram and Discord, the links are down below. And if you enjoy what I do and you'd like to support what I do, then you can always check out my Patreon for all of my art, a first look at all the videos without any ads, um, all of the complete speed paints, the entire art and show collection for all of my patrons. I'll leave a link up here. You can also grab my brush kit on there, by the way. Um, I'll leave a link up here in the cards. Make sure you check that out. And I really appreciate all the support. Are there any other artists you'd like to see a style study on in the future? First check out my style study playlist, I'll leave it here in the outro in just a sec. I've done a ton of these, chances are I've probably covered some of your faves on the series already, but if I haven't, feel free to comment below or better yet, come let me know on my Discord server so it doesn't get lost in the comments. But yeah, that's about everything I have to say today. So thank you guys so, so much for hanging out with me. I really hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Check out some more style studies down here. Happy style study month. And I'll see you guys on the next one. Bye.